as we as we get started, I want to encourage you to get out your Bibles, your pens, your paper, uh, pencil, whatever it is you like to write with. Uh, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 23, and uh, we're looking at Jesus and his prayer on the cross, and then the thief, the penitent thief, and his prayer on the cross as we study scriptures that encourage us to pray. So really excited about um, getting into God's word with you tonight. And... Um, so let's uh, let's bow our heads uh, for a word of word of prayer. We're going to have our evening prayer, and uh, then we're going to go to our prayer app. Uh, our church uses a prayer app called PrayerCares.org, and um, we are going to lift up uh, some of the prayers that we have uh, received. Uh, we have a digital prayer ministry. And so if you have any prayer requests or praise reports, I um, want to encourage you to, um, to uh, go to our, our website, faithlakeforest.org, and um, go, go there and click on the prayer button. And then um, you can put in your prayer request for yourself or for others, and we'll be happy to pray for you. So let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. We'll begin here with the uh, evening prayer, as we always do. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, I want to encourage you to turn in your Bibles now to Luke chapter 23. Yes, I switched the camera. Jim, uh, Jim Rinaldi caught that. And uh, because I'm going to be using um, my uh, new uh, whiteboards. They just came, uh, delivery, and, uh, and so I flipped it because I'm going to actually write some stuff on here tonight. And so this way it'll look correct to you. So I'm, I'm using new school technology with flipping the, the image in the, in the uh, camera. And then also I'm using some old school technology here. And I'm really excited because I ordered, I got three of them in, in, my, uh, in my order. So I've got a lot that I can use here. And um, I'm really looking forward to that. We're going to be jumping right into that. So let's go to Luke chapter 23. And we're going to be looking at uh, the crucifixion. And so let me just read this for you. Um, and just to give you the context a little bit, of course, Luke chapter 22 is the, uh, the uh, capture and the trials of Christ. And then that goes into the beginning of Luke chapter 23. And as you remember, Jesus underwent three religious trials. And then he also underwent three uh, civil uh, military trials as well. And so then, uh, and then we pick it up in Luke chapter 23, uh, where uh, he's about to be crucified. Uh, verse 26. As they led Jesus away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. And I think that's kind of important to point out because a lot of times, you know, we hear people talk about on Palm Sunday, there was all these crowds, and by the end of the week, there was nobody there. But actually, there was a large crowd that followed Jesus to Calvary. Uh, it just says it right there. A large number of people followed him. Okay, so then uh, verse 28, Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the barren women, the, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if men do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with Jesus to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. And they divided up Jesus' clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at Jesus. They said he saved others. Let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, the chosen one, the soldiers also came and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a notice above him, which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at Jesus. Aren't you the Christ? Aren't you the Messiah? Messiah, then save yourself and us. 
But the other criminal rebuked the first one saying, don't you fear God since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then the penitent thief, the sorrowful thief said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. So tonight, we're going to look at the two prayers there. We're going to look at the prayer of uh, Jesus, and then we're going to look at the prayer of um, the penitent thief. And the first thing we're going to do tonight, though, is we're going, to, we're going to look at something that Luke does often under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And that is uh, Luke uses a, a literary device, and it's called a chiasm, C-H-I-A-S. M, a chiasm. Doesn't that look so nice there? A chiasm. And so what is a chiasm? A chiasm, so for example, in the text for tonight, we're going to see a four-part chiasm. We're going to see, so Luke 23, if you want to write this down, Luke 23, 30, verse 33b says, in part, it says, if this one is the Christ of God, if this one is the Christ of God, okay, you see that in Luke 23, verse 33b, and then, you, then we have Luke 23, 37, which says, if you are the king of the Jews, so if you're writing it out, it looks like this, Rich, good evening, Mary, good evening, so Luke 23, 33b is the first one, then Luke 23, 37. So Luke 23, 33b has the phrase in there, the Christ. Luke 23, 37 says, King of the Jews. Okay. And then Luke 23, 38 also says, King of the Jews. Okay, and then we have Luke, and I'm going to hold this up for you so you can see it here in a second. Luke 23, 39 has the phrase, the Christ. Okay, and so this is called a chiasm because of how it's structured. So you have the first and last have the same phrase in it, which is the Christ. And then these middle two have king of the Jews. And so why is this important? Well, it's a liter literary device that's intentionally used. There are some scholars, for example, who hold that the entire book of Acts can be div divided up into four chiasms uh, based off of the, um, the sending of the, the, the church into the world, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Um, in Luke, for example, and of course Luke is the author of Luke and Acts, Luke earlier, and I mentioned this in one of our earlier devotionals, Luke um, when it does a five-part chiasm with the Jesus on the road to Emmaus with the disciples. And we use the circles, remember those inner, inner circles, five concentric circles, and we laid out how the brackets, how the first and the last one are connected, the second and the fourth, so on and so forth. Um, if you if you don't uh, if you ever had a chance to see that, go to our YouTube channel and uh, and you can watch it there. So this is a device that Luke uses in the reading for tonight. It's a much simpler one. It's just a, a four two part you know four four pieces to it chiasm. And so and so what do they all have in common? They all have in common the mocking of Jesus. And so Luke, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, very intentionally uh, makes the mocking of Jesus into a distinct focus or even subsection of this chapter. It's, he's highlighting it and he's using this literary device uh, to do that. So this is uh, the first use of the whiteboard here and uh, look forward to uh, getting better with it and sharing, uh, sharing it, using it to share with you in the future. So in the, in the text for today, um, we're going to focus uh, ultimately on Jesus' uh, response to the prayer of the penitent thief, which is in verse 42 and 43, <coughs> where the penitent thief says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answers, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me uh, in paradise. 
So um, now Jesus, when uh, he is uh, on on the cross, there he has um, a lot going on. Obviously, the the, the crowd is uh, there are people within the crowd who are mocking him, and uh, he has the the one thief on on the one side also mocking him, and uh, and so. Jesus' focus on his purpose is an amazing thing to behold. And as we look at this scene, we are reminded of an earlier passage, which I want to ask you to write down, and that's Luke chapter 12, verses 50 to 51. <clears throat> In Luke chapter 12, 50 to 51, let me read it for you. Jesus said, I have a baptism to be baptized with. So this is not, he's not talking about the Jordan River. He's talking about a baptism that's yet to come. I have a baptism to be baptized with. How great is my distress until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to give peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. And so this baptism, this is really important to get this, in Luke 12, the baptism that Jesus is talking about is the crucifixion, okay? And um, the, the, the crucifixion is the goal of his anointing. That is, that is the reason he has come, to be the sacrificial lamb to pay for the sins of the world. And it is on this cross where he is truly revealed as the Christ, the Messiah of God, which we see that phrase in Luke 23, verse 35. And um, earlier in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus said that when the Son of Man is lifted up, he will draw all believers unto him. And uh, we read about that in Luke chapter 9, verse 51. So you want to write that down. Luke 9, verse 51. And so this is where Jesus is lifted up. He's not lifted up with worldly praise and worldly acclaim. Um, he's not lifted up on a marquee. He's not lifted up on a, on a pedestal. No, he's lifted up on the tree. He's lifted up on the cross. He's lifted up like the serpent was lifted up on the pole. And the, all the Isra Israelites who looked at it uh, were saved. Uh, so also all who call upon the name of Christ will be saved as well. Can we give God a praise clap for that tonight? Amen. Can we give thumbs up? smiley faces, hearts, all those great emojis. Yeah, it's, this is really, really good stuff. And so then as we look at the text for tonight here in Luke chapter 23, Jesus has a very interesting prayer. I want to uh, draw your attention to it again uh, in Luke chapter 23. Uh, Jesus prays and um, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. You know, and that's really quite the prayer if you stop and think about it, because um, how in the world is it that they don't know what they're doing? I mean, are their, their eyes blindfolded? I mean, the, the Roman soldiers, they've never done this sort of thing before. They've never crucified somebody. How, how exactly is it that they don't know what they're doing? You know, I mean, uh, all those uh, sham trials that Jesus had to endure, uh, it just sort of happened, you know, uh, accidentally. I mean, no. I mean, so how, what is Jesus talking about? What is Jesus saying? Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. You know, I've often thought that what Jesus uh, was, is appealing to here is Deuteronomy chapter 19, verses 4 to 5. Uh, and I, I, I just would ask you to write this down. Deuteronomy chapter 19, verses 4 to 5. <clears throat> uh, Deuteronomy chapter 19, verses 4 to 5 say, says, If anyone kills his neighbor unintentionally without having hated him in the past, as when someone goes into the forest with his neighbor to cut wood, his hand swings the axe to cut down the tree, and the head slips from the handle and strikes his neighbor so that he dies. Then he is, he is innocent. And he goes on in Deuteronomy chapter 19 to say that, that um, this person can flee to a city of refuge. And so I think Jesus is doing a couple of things here. First of all, he's, he is asking God to, for forgiveness for these soldiers and for the people who are carrying this out. And he is claiming uh, the, 
God's word uh, on their behalf and uh, because he does not want them to be stand condemned for uh, what he has come to do, not just for them, but for the entire world. And also Jesus is saying something even deeper theologically. Jesus is saying what? That he is the city of refuge that all of us who are sinners can run into and be saved. Can we give God a praise clap for that? In the Old Testament, there were three uh, distinct locations for that. But in Christ, he is everywhere available to all people at all time. Can we give God a praise clap for that? Amen. Um, now, what's amazing to me also is when you look here, then Jesus prays, Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. And then this prayer of Jesus moves the, the one thief um, he's, he is moved by, by Jesus' grace, and then, and then this thief becomes a believer. And so the prayer of Christ has an immediate impact. It has an immediate impact upon the thief who is there on a cross next to him. And, and I think that this is, this is important for us to consider also the, 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 what I want to call the imminence of Jesus in our prayer life. Because I, I think sometimes we, we sort of focus on the transcendence, the, the, the awesomeness, the majesty of Jesus um, in prayer. And, and this is a wonderful thing. But he's not just far off. He is, after all, Emmanuel. He is God with us. And here, uh, I mean, my gosh, for that thief on the cross who became a believer, the imminence, the nearness of Christ is right there. And I, and I think we would do well also to have that perspective in our prayer life, that we're not just beseeching our Father in heaven who sits, who's, who's seated upon his throne, but that we have an advocate. We have Jesus who is, argues on our behalf, and he has called us his brother. He has called us his sister. Can we give God a praise clap for that? tonight? Amen. Amen. These are scriptures that encourage you to pray. Because the fact of the matter is, is that we're all going to have our thief on the cross moment in our lives. We're all going to have those, those, those times in our life where we're just going to think, my gosh, what good can possibly come out of the situation that I'm in? And when you're in that situation in life, brothers and sisters in Christ, I want you to remember this thief on the cross who looked upon the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and whose heart was transformed by this and who called upon Jesus and asked Jesus, his savior, to remember him in his kingdom. Wow. <laughs> and then let's look at Luke 23, verse 41. Then this penitent thief turns and says to the unpenitent, the, un, the, un, the, 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 the thief who's not sorry for what he's done, and he says to this thief, we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man, referring to Jesus, has done nothing wrong. And so, I, you know, I just, I want to point this out to you. I don't know if, you, if you've thought about this, but this is the first time in Scripture that a believer declares Jesus to be innocent. It's the first time in scripture that, that a believer declares Jesus to be innocent. There are five times where Jesus is declared to be innocent prior to this. Uh, and uh, the, the citations for that are Luke 23, 4, 14, 15, and 22. 4, 14, 15, and 22. And you can rewind the tape later and, and discuss it, share it with your friends, and they can click on it. We'll get another view out of it. But in those four verses, then, those are all, those are all unbelievers who pronounce Jesus to be innocent. So the first person to pronounce Jesus to be innocent is this unnamed thief on the cross. But it's, it doesn't end there. Because then we look at verse 42. And then the thief, it says, and then the thief said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And so isn't this also interesting that this thief is the first human to enter the fullness of the kingdom that Jesus is now preparing? Isn't that something? And he's also the first to embrace Jesus as the one who saves others, the Christ the king of the Jews. 
And how does this happen? This man's heart was changed by the testimony of Jesus. His response is the result of God's grace, as is always the case when an unbeliever is converted and then confesses Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. It is always the result of the work of God's grace. Faith comes through hearing the, hearing the word, and this word is the message of Christ. And this work is the work of the Holy Spirit, who calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth. Can we give God a praise clap? Amen. Amen. And so, you know, what a beautiful picture here of this thief on the cross whose, whose name we don't know, but, but is, is uh, the participant of so many firsts in the history of the church. In Romans chapter 6, verse 5, we read, If we have been united with Christ in a death like his. Now think about this for that thief on the cross. If we have been united with Christ in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. And what is Romans chapter 6 talking about there at the very beginning? It's talking about baptism. And so this description of baptism was experienced uh, in an amazing way by this penitent thief. And this experience of baptism is our experience today. For as many of us as were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death. Therefore, just as he was raised from the dead, so also we will be raised from the dead. And that's why we always want to talk about the sacraments, about baptism and communion, because these are the means of grace that God works through to bless us into a right relationship with him. Amen? Amen. Let's give God a, a thumbs up. Let's give God a praise clap for this tonight. And then finally, we, we look here in Luke chapter 23, and the thief says to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The thief simply asked that Jesus would remember him, but Jesus gives the thief so much more than what the thief has ever asked for. Jesus says, today, today you will be with me in paradise, not later, today. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, today is the day of salvation. Amen. And then Jesus says, with me, Today you will be with me. And we remember the words in Luke chapter 1 of the angel who said to Mary, the Lord is with you. Amen? Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the love of your Savior Jesus that he desires for you to experience his grace, for your heart to be transformed, and for you to be secure in what he has secured for you and made available to you at no charge. As I was thinking about a hymn to use for our wrap-up, I looked and I found Jesus Pitying the Sighs. It's in the old TLH hymnal, hymn number 181 by Thomas Pollock. Thomas Pollock, Thomas B. Pollock, lived from 1836 to 1896. He got his master's in divinity from Trinity College in Dublin, Ireland in 1863. He lived 60 years. He wrote many hymns. May we number our days aright and make known to others God's grace to us all. Listen to these words. Jesus pitying the sighs of the thief who near thee dies, promising him paradise. Hear us, holy Jesus. May we in our guilt and shame still thy love and mercy claim, calling humbly on thy name. Hear us, holy Jesus. May our hearts to thee incline, looking from our cross to thine. Cheer our souls with hope divine. Hear us, holy Jesus. Amen, amen, happy people. I want to encourage you to go to our website, faithlikeforest.org. On our website, there's a button there. You can put your prayer requests in and I want to encourage you to click on that. You can put prayer requests, praise reports for yourself, for others. If your ministry is looking for a prayer app, you can use the one that we use. Go to prayercares.org. Set one up for your own ministry. It's, uh, there's no cost for that. And um, 
I want to encourage you again to, to share this broadcast uh, with those whom you know and whom you care for, because uh, these are scriptures that encourage us to pray. Amen. Let's go in peace. Let's serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. See you tomorrow night, 715, for our daily devotion.